This is the East series. It's a veteran and pioneer of the action RPG landscape, and if we consider the first and second entry as one game, now boasts nine titles in its mainline canonical series, with its most recent in East 9 Monstrum Nox releasing in the West in February of 2021. As of 2017, the series has sold over 4.8 million copies worldwide since its inception in 1987, and continues to perform well, as in 2018, East 8 Lacrimosa of Dana became the fastest selling East title at that point in time, with 500,000 copies sold in a little over two years. Though still considered niche in the general sense, it's no exaggeration to say that East is one of the two flagships of Neon Falcon's fleet, along with the Trail series. Captivating through the simple premise of recounting the adventures of its recognisable protagonist, Adol Kristen, and his partner Dogi. Consolidated with periodic merchandise releases and a strong push to release on multiple platforms and internationally, Neon Falcom have managed to spread most of its mainline titles to various markets, despite its position as a relatively small company, which only holds around 60 employees as of the time of writing. Despite that endeavour though, it's not inaccurate to say that even the East series remains incomplete to this day in the eyes of veterans. Though many of the titles have either performed well or had in-house remakes, there remains a void within its library, a noticeable blotch of ink within this grand novel yet to be corrected. It's not an embellishment to state that this blot almost ended the series altogether. And that is East 5, Kefin, The Lost City of Sand which is a fitting name, for that is what East 5 remains to this day. Lost and forgotten. But why? Why has East 5 been left behind while the other games push on to ever greater heights? What did East 5 do wrong in the eyes of fans, and is it likely that it will ever be revived? In order to find our answer, we need to first go back to its predecessor in East 4. After a four-year gap from the release of East 3, Wanderers from East, Falcom set about working on the next instalment in 1993. However, due to the unfavourable position that the company found itself in at the time, with many employees having left in this period, they lacked the manpower to develop it in-house, and thus they pitched the idea to other developers. And what resulted were two games. East 4 Mask of the Sun was released by Tonkin House for the Super Famicom in November 1993, while East 4 The Dawn of East was released on the TurboGrafx-16 by Hudson Soft in December of the same year. Both companies had been involved with the series before this point, with Tonkin House creating a Super Famicom port of East 3, while Hudson Soft had worked on ports of East 1, 2 and 3 for the TurboGrafx-16. To ensure that Falcom still had a degree of creative influence, however, they provided both companies with an outline of the plot, while also granting music from Sound Team JDK, so it's no wonder that both versions have some common tracks. However, the games themselves took on slightly different interpretations. Though the stories were relatively similar, the gameplay was markedly different between the two with many fans at the time preferring the more polished version of Dawn of East provided by Hudson Soft, though Falcom themselves stated that Mask of the Sun was the canonical version due to it not straying too far from what Falcom had originally planned. A point to be highlighted in this period though is that these were the first East games developed exclusively for consoles, they never received a home computer version which at this point was Falcom's main market. But fans acquiesced, for this was not Falcom's choice as an in-house development. So when they finally did return to East in 1995 with the fifth canonical entry, fans were excited, as it was stated that the company would be developing the game in-house rather than outsourcing it. However, there was already a problem. Whereas previous East titles like Ancient East Vanished had followed the formula set by the company since 1981, releasing on Japanese home computers like the PC-8801, abbreviated to PC-88, it was announced that East 5 would not follow suit. In an attempt to break into the ever-growing console market, East 5 became the first Falcom-developed title for the Super Famicom. And though this arguably was an important shift in focus for Neon Falcom in the long run, it was met with semi-muted animosity. That it was coming to a console was not the main issue. Similar instances had happened in the past with the enhanced remakes of East 1 and 2 releasing on the TurboGrafx-16 in 1989. The issue was that it was only coming to the Super Famicom. For over a decade, Falcom had built a small but dedicated fanbase through their development of titles on home computers, who were drawn to the East series in particular for their unrelenting challenge and excellent music. 
This departure from their tried and tested platform alienated the current player base, who were now being left behind for the good of the company, which ultimately meant that East 5 was starting from scratch. Rather than capitalising on an albeit small but enraptured fanbase, they were now attempting to adhere to a new market who had no idea what the East series even was. However, if the game was able to replicate the magic of the previous entries, especially East 1 and 2, there was a good chance that the game would have been successful. Needless to say, this did not happen. Now I myself have not actually played East 5, I've only seen gameplay. So when it comes to analysing why East 5 failed from a gameplay perspective, I feel like I should ask someone who is more well versed in the series, and fortunately, I have just the person to get in contact with. Hey pal, what's going on? Hey bud, thanks for taking my call. So, um, don't want to be around the bush, but I'm currently working on a video for East 5 at the moment. But you know, outside of like, you know, general research, I don't really know too much about the game. So if you get where I'm coming from, I don't have the personal feel as to what was wrong with it. And naturally when I started to think of someone who was, well, knowledgeable in the subject, I thought of you. So I was wondering if you could like, I don't know, help me out or... Or maybe just put me in the direction of someone who does know. He's five, eh? Yeah, I got the perfect person, my buddy Jeff. He's one of the founding members of my team and happens to be the translator who worked with Aeon Genesis on that. He's five fan translation? The one for Super Famicom, yeah? Oh, really? Oh, actually, that's, actually, that's perfect. You know, it is for the Super Famicom version. So, yeah, if, if he can help, he'll be perfect. Cool. Um... Give me a bit, I'll message him and see if he's cool with me giving you his number or email or something. Oh, nice one. Thanks, buddy. Uh, I'll keep an eye out for it then. Cheers. With the assistance of Linfinite, I was able to get in contact with Jeff, who, as mentioned before, is the translator who worked with Aeon Genesis to release an English fan patch for East 5 in 2013. His other achievements include providing some of the first fan translations to be purchased in an official capacity by Xseed, those being the likes of East 1 and 2, East Origin, and Ophinfell Ganna. Here's what he had to say. Hi Jeff, thank you for taking some time out of your day. So, I'll just get straight into it. First of all, why do you think East 5 failed compared to the previous entries? Were there notable departures in gameplay, for example, or game design? I'd say the game struggled because, first and foremost, it's absurdly easy in its vanilla release. Um, you could complete it pretty easily in about five hours with pretty few deaths, if any at all. Um, it was so poorly received that they put out an expert re-release like only three or four months later. And, but even that didn't do much. I mean, really, it didn't do much of anything at all, technically, other than boost damage values, lower, lowered, you know, lowered your strength, boosted enemy attack strength and everything. But it didn't really address any of the fundamental issues that made the game weaker than previous ones. It also has a really different look and feel to it from the previous games. It doesn't really have that anime, that 90s anime look that the earlier games did. Um, and it... The look is closer to late era Super Nintendo Squaresoft games. Um, it sounds closer um, sonically to a Final Fantasy game than to previous East games. Um, I mean, it looks good. It, the graphics and everything are very quali high quality and the sound samples all are very good and the composition is solid and everything, but it is very different and fans did not take very kindly to the change. Um, and yeah, they complained long and loud about it. Um, as that aside, it also, uh, one of the other big changes was that it, it required a button press, both for sword and for, and for shield use. So you actually had to hold a button to hold up your shield, which locked you into place, and you, would have, you could turn in four directions, although you could move in eight. Um, and uh, gameplay aside, um, it's also hampered by its plot. Uh, it centers really around alchemy and magic, but the alchemy that's you know the magic system that's based around alchemy in the game is basically worthless um, most spells aren't useful enough to be worth casting uh, they have a long startup and they don't really do all that much some of them look pretty neat but it's really undercooked um, 
it's and it's just really not very well tested. Um, the way that they work, it almost it's kind of like Skyrim. Your magic strength and your sword um, strength they level up independently of each other based on how many enemies you kill with them. And the thing is, since magic is not very useful to begin with, you tend not to use it very much, so it never gets more powerful. Um, meanwhile, your sword attacks keep, you know, will continue to level up like normal. The other thing is that magic does not work on bosses at all. Whether that was a programming oversight or intentional design, who knows. As stated by Jeff, it's clear that East 5 was a massive departure from the games of old. Its art style and menus were adapted to a more generic design, Gone was the bump system, and the new magic element in Alchemy was useless. However, something else to consider as well is that many fans were drawn to the challenge and music of Falcom games. As said earlier, they did release an expert version of the game which did little to stem the negativity, but there also has to be mention of the soundtrack. Though the sound clips themselves were objectively high quality, the Super Famicom effectively hamstrung what Sound Team JDK were able to make. The PC-88 in particular utilised an FM synthesis chip from Yamaha which allowed for more complex harmonic renditions. It allowed Sound Team JDK to bring the World of East to life with its signature synth rock style that still endures to this day as some of the most notable music in JRPGs. However, the technical capability of the Super Famicom was far below that of its home computer contemporary. As a result, it made the music more orchestral and style, and though it was a far cry from bad music, another area where East games usually shone was rendered null and void. All of these elements together resulted in one simple fact. East 5 lost its identity as an East game, instead becoming a generic RPG within the Super Famicom's library, which already had a slew of quality titles in the same genre, such as Secret of Mana, Final Fantasy VI, and Chrono Trigger. Compared to its peers, East 5 didn't hold up at all. And though it did get a re-release on the PlayStation 2 by Taito in 2006, fixing some of the issues from the original, it again failed to flatter, especially considering the treatment that other East titles, like East 3, had experienced at the hands of Falcom themselves. While games like Wanderers from East were remade into the likes of Oath and Falgana, which is lauded as one of the most popular titles in the series to this date, East 5 was seemingly forgotten, as if Falcom wanted to remove the mistake from the annals of history. It can't be understated as well, the poor timing of the release itself on a system that was already on its final legs. So Jeff, why do you believe it took so long for Falcon to recover from this? I would say, I mean, primarily they let the, the series lie dormant for about eight years because East 5 was a huge flop. Um, also, East 5 came out, it, it was also at the tail end of the Super Famicom's life, and it was it was contemporary with some pretty big name games and just given how easy it was and how short it was it just really didn't stand up to some of the other stuff that was coming out around that time i think it might have been a contemporary of things like star ocean and the original what was it tales of fantasia um so yeah i mean it's really not going to measure up to anything like that the commercial failure of East 5 was seemingly a warning to Falcom that a loyal fanbase only remains as such if you give them what they came for in the first place. It was a mistake that could have prematurely ended what is now one of its finest works, and it's fair to deduce that they likely didn't want it to happen again, hence the long hiatus. They couldn't get the next effort wrong. It took them eight years to return with East 6 The Ark of Napishtim in 2003, which is widely regarded as the title that revived the series. 
And though some elements were carried over from East 5, like the abandonment of the bump system which was seen as outdated by the early 2000s, it regained the initial charm of the original titles, with an excellent synthesized soundtrack and a fast-paced but fair and decent challenge, on top of capitalizing on a simple yet charming presentation style. Since that point, the series has gone from strength to strength, and is now here to stay for the foreseeable future as an enduring classic of the action RPG landscape. But what about East 5? Well, despite its wide designation as a black sheep of the series, there are still fans who hold a special place for the game, and even wish to see it return in some form. Okay, that makes sense. And, you know, finally, would you want to see, I don't know, some sort of East 5 remake? Like, could the story that was originally told be expanded upon or integrated further into the wider series? I wouldn't call the plot some lost masterpiece of gaming literature or anything like that, but it's it's solid enough. It's pretty straightforward as far as, you know, kind of boilerplate being for an East game. You know, Adol shows to up in, a, in some land, you know, bordering the, the Meadow Sea, which is the world's equivalent to the Mediterranean. And lo and behold, he uncovers a lost civilization. And that's kind of one of the nice things about being around the Mediterranean. There's a lot of people who've been living there for a really long time, and a lot of civilizations have died off. So they've got like this endless well of stuff they could work off of. Um, but the way that the game works, the, the, the plot is not really a major driving force, although it feels like it should be at, at times. Um, a lot of it is there more by way of suggestion than direct exposition. And it leaves a lot of questions um, regarding like who some of these characters are, what their motivations are, how they relate to each other. Like there are some, a couple of enemies that are kind of interesting, but they don't really get to do much. Um, but there is a lot there, you know, there, it has, you could say it has good bones. Um, there's a lot there that could be expanded upon for the sake of a remake. Um, but yeah, I'd say that the, the story, it's, it's worth experiencing, absolutely. And, you know, I do have a lot of love for East 5, and it is, again, you know, worth playing, but you should definitely go in with tempered expectations. Oh man, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Jeff. You've been a great help and, uh, well, I hope you have a solid weekend, whatever it is you plan to do. Hey, no problem. It's, uh, it's been good talking with you. Uh, if you have any other questions and stuff, drop me a line. I'm always happy to talk East, so have a good one. Thanks. So, in conclusion, is there a potential future for East 5? With the continued grow fan success of the series and a now loyal and dedicated global fanbase, would giving it a much needed remake result in the same hiatus as over two decades prior should it fail? You'd have to think it wouldn't, not anymore. Due to the series' rich and storied past, East fans who are captivated by the old will likely stick with the new, as long as it doesn't stray too far from its core fundamentals. They are now wholly invested in the grand adventures of Adol, as if walking side by side by the red-haired adventurer himself. As for Falcon themselves, Kondo stated back in 2017 that he would like to have a second go at East 5, as there were many ideas never implemented into the original. But, unfortunately, it seems that this is merely a pipe dream at the moment. Not only does it seem like there will be no new East game for the 35th anniversary if recent reports are to be believed, but in April, Kondo had already stated that East 10 would be the next entry to see development. Naturally, this is unconfirmed as of now, but the simple truth of the matter is that if Neon Falcon doesn't wish to revisit East 5, thus leaving its access only to the most dedicated of fans, then the lost kingdom of Kefin will remain just that.